This is where did the road go. Our aim is to explore the fringe, to be true skeptics and question openly, to investigate the paranormal, bring light to the dark corners of history, and give a voice to the shunned of science. We deal in mystery and the important questions that these subjects bring to light. What is reality? Who are we? And why are we here? Join us on the web at wheredidtheroadgo.com for a full show archive, links to all our social media, upcoming schedule, and much, much more. Now, join your host Soraya on this week's edition of Where Did the Road Go? And welcome to this week's edition of Where Did the Road Go? Tonight's show is pre-recorded, so uh, the chat room won't be active for you to ask questions in. Um, this is often the case when we have people from the UK, as we do tonight. We're going to be talking with Scott Crichton and about his book, The Secret Chamber of Osiris, Lost Knowledge of the Sixteen Pyramids. And just real briefly, next week we're going to have uh, Mike Cleland and Aaron Gullius back so we can continue our discussion on the history of the UFO phenomena. The week after that I have Laird Scranton coming on. And uh, beyond that, I know I have Douglas Dietrich scheduled. Not sure when that's going to air yet. I have Maria Wheatley coming up again. And some other fun stuff in the works. So without any further ado, here's my interview with Scott Crichton. So welcome to the show, Scott. Hello, Saraya. It's good to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Now, uh, you have two books out, right? Yeah. Um, my first book was out in December 2012, that's The Giza Prophecy, and mm-hmm. my most recent book came out on Christmas Day and uh, last year, 2014. So, um, yeah, that's two books now. I'm now working on, on my third, which has been accepted for publication by my publisher, Bearing Company, Inner Traditions Bearing Company, so, so that's all good. Awesome. Yeah, I, I really love that book company, honestly. They put out so much great stuff. Absolutely. I mean, I, I'm looking at my bookshelf just now and the number of um, titles that I've got here from Inner Traditions Bairn Co. It's, it's quite remarkable. Yeah, me too. Um, and the new book is called The Secret Chamber of Osiris, Lost Knowledge of the Sixteen Pyramids. That's the one, yep. And uh, this one kind of had a lot of stuff in it I didn't know anything about, which is always a good thing. <laughs> um, and... Uh, Want to tell people a little bit about what the 16 pyramids are? Right, okay. Well, first of all, you're not the first person, Soraya, to tell me that this book contains a lot of new information. Um, it, it certainly does that. Well, the 16 pyramids, that is a reference to um, the ancient Egyptian god Osiris, which is um, the, the t- part of the title of the book, The Secret Chamber of Osiris. In the myth um, that's come down to us about Osiris um, from um, Plutarch, um, we're told that um, Osiris uh, had a brother, Set, who was basically jealous of the fact that Osiris was the king of Egypt. And Set um, didn't like this. He wanted the throne of Egypt for himself. So basically he set about um, undermining Osiris, and eventually he kills Osiris, murders Osiris with um, 72 conspirators. And he cuts the body of Osiris up into 16 parts. This is what we're told. Some some versions of the story um, say uh, 14 parts. The Plutarch version of the story says 14 parts, but the Diodorus version says 16 parts. The Diodorus version is the earlier version. Said me 14 parts, 16 parts. Um, Osiris's body is cut into by Set and his gang of conspirators, and it's scattered across the land of Egypt. These 16 parts are scattered across the land of Egypt, and um, basically, um, Isis, who was the wife of Osiris, um, went about Egypt looking for the parts of Osiris in order to. Uh, wrap the body in linen and mummy wrapping to wrap the body, to find the body parts and wrap them together to make Osiris whole again. Um, but she could only find um, 
parts. Uh, she found most of the parts except one part, which was the, the phallus of Osiris. Now, that's one part of the the the, the connection, if you like. Um, the other part was I was reading the the pyramid texts, the ancient Egyptian pyramid texts. Now, these are the earliest religious writings that we have anywhere in the world. And there, these writings were inscribed upon the walls of the the fifth dynasty pyramids of um, Teti and, and Yunus, the pharaohs or the kings of Egypt, King Yunus, King Teti. And in these texts, we are told, in these religious writings, we are told that it says this quite clearly, the pyramid is Osiris. The construction is the construction of the pyramid is Osiris. And it says that quite clearly and quite succinctly. So I got to thinking, I started connecting dots here and thought, well, wait a minute, if the pyramid texts are saying the pyramid is Osiris, and we're told that Set cut his body into 16 parts and scattered them across the land of Egypt, well, wouldn't that then be set essentially scattering 16 pyramids across the mm. land of Egypt? So that really was the connection. And um, I, I, I'm not sure, I'm not 100% sure, but I think I'm probably maybe the first person to make that sort of association. Now, what I then did was um, I, I thought, well, okay, let's, let's have a wee look at this. Let's look at the first... Um, 16 completed pyramids that the ancient Egyptians built. Now, I got um, Dr. Mark Lehner's book, The Complete Pyramids, which is a fantastic book for anyone interested in you know, learning about the you know, ancient Egyptian culture. It's a really, really good book for you know beginners you know to to learn the, the sort of elementaries about um, the ancient Egyptian civilization. Well, anyway, in Dr. Lehner's um, book, um, he lists... Um, the first 19 pyramids, and this takes us up from the very first pyramid that built at uh, uh, Saqqara, the Step Pyramid, right up to the Pyramid of Minkaura at Giza. Now, there's that's a total of 19 pyramids, but three of them, we know, barely got off the ground. They were never completed. So in that mm. list there, you've got 16 pyramids, and that takes you up to the end of the Great Pyramid Building Age, funnily enough. You know, so... What I then did, I took the the 16 um, completed pyramids and I plotted them onto a map of Giza. And I, I didn't think anything would, would, would come of it. But what I found when I looked back and saw what I had plotted was that, I, I don't know if you're familiar, um, Saraya, with the, the sort of... Um, classic image of Osiris, the god Osiris. He stands there with his atif crown. Now, the atif crown is a white crown with three prongs which um, come out the top of the crown. And in the, cent the centre prong of the crown is slightly taller than the, the two at the sides. And he, he stands straight down. He has his arms crossed with a crook and flail one in each hand, and then right, his body right. straight down. You know, th that's a classic um, Osiris um, figure. What I found when I plotted these 16, you know, these first pyramids onto the ground at, um, at Giza, or in, in Egypt, you've got the, the, the step pyramid at Saqqara, you've got the pyramids at Dashur, you've got the pyramids at Giza, um, you've got the pyramids at Abu Rawash, the pyramids at Medum. So I plotted all those onto the ground, and lo and behold, I couldn't believe it, it created what I call a sort of outline, a basic outline, a stick man, if you like, of the classic Osiris figure, with the crown, with the three prongs, the centre one slightly longer, the the, the, the crossed arms with the, the, the crook and flail, and then the, 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 the legs just going straight down. You know, you know, from the, the very top um, pyramid, which is the highest pyramid, that represented the highest the highest point of this Osiris figure. The pyramid at Abu Rawash is the highest pyramid um, in, um, 
I think in Egypt actually. Um, don't quote me on that, but I think it's certainly in the the Memphite region. That's the highest pyramid, going down all the way down to Medum. It created uh, the classic outline shape of the god Osiris when I plotted these um, first sixteen pyramids onto a map of of Giza. So there you go. That's the that's the sixteen pyramids. That's hmm. that's where the whole um, concept comes from. But the, the the secret chamber aspect of it, what that is, is um, Isis. If the 16 pyramids are visible, these are the visible pyramids, we're told that Isis found all those parts. Now, this is all allegorical mythology we're dealing with right. here. You know, we're, we're, we're given hidden messages in this myth. This is what I think we're being told. So she found all the the 16 parts because, hey, they're up in the ground, they're visible, you can see them for 20, 30, 40 miles away. Yeah, so she could find all those, but there's a part she couldn't find. And what I think that is saying is that there's a hidden, maybe not a pyramid as such, but there's a hidden vault, because each of the pyramids have vaults inside them. There's a hidden vault, a secret chamber, somewhere um, close, I think, to Giza. And that is what the secret chamber of Osiris is all about. I actually went to Egypt, um, I, I pinpointed I came up with a theory that pinpointed where I believe that um, secret chamber actually was, and I went to Egypt uh, back in 2008 to try and find it. So that's that's essentially what the secret chamber of Osiris lost knowledge of the 16 pyramids. That's the bare bones of what the, the book is about. Okay, and uh, there are a lot of different legends about hidden chambers, aren't there? Oh, yeah. I mean... Um, you know, uh, yeah, there's 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 many many um, um, tales of um, secret knowledge, hall of records. You know, um, that's 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 come down to us. Um, there's a specific one um, about um, Thoth um, hiding the the secret knowledge, the the books of Osiris, um, basically somewhere. Um, you know. In Egypt, somewhere, uh, you know, it's 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 invisible. You know, these 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 it specifically says that um, this chamber is unseen, which to me implies well, that means it must be a, a buried chamber of of some kind. And as as I said earlier, um, I came up with a theory where um, I believed um, this uh, this secret chamber was actually located, and. A funny thing is, um, I actually, oh, when was it? I think it was in was it 2009, something, something like that. I wrote to Dr. Zahi Hawass, who was then the, you know, the head guy in the Supreme Council of Antiquities in Egypt. Right. And um, I, to I told him about the theory and where I believed this um, chamber might be, and. Um, you know, it was it was quite incredible. Within a few months of that email going to Dr. Hawass, the site was being majorly excavated. Now, this is a site that's been that's laying untouched, you know, for millions of years. And then all of a sudden, I write to Hawass with this theory. <laughs> you know, I explain it to him. You know, and then you know, a few months later, it's been majorly excavated. Now, that could just be pure coincidence. You know, it could be, but hey, you know. There, yeah. there could be more too. Maybe he you know, figured so, there's a chance you're right. He better look into it. Well, well, that's <laughs> well, that's 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 basically it, it could be that. Um, the thing is, if you go into Google Earth, you no, know, you can actually look at the site and you can see it's it's been completely concreted. It looks like it's been concreted over, completely co concreted over. And actually, oh. um, a guy um, that had been um, working with he sent me some once i'd identified this location um, he sent me some gamma um, processed images of the actual location and you know to me there looks as if and to him as well there looks as if there is a geometric forum under that spot that that, that i identified but again, and it's now been concreted over. So I don't know. Um, I could be making a mountain out of, or a pyramid out of a molehill. Who knows? Um, but it's certainly, 
It's certainly very interesting. Now, you had tried to actually walk to that location. Yeah, I did. Um, as I said, I, I identified where I thought this chamber, the secret hidden chamber, the lost part of Osiris um, was. Um, and um, in 2008, I um, went into the, 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 the Giza Plateau and headed basically um, southwest. And um, eventually I, uh, uh, I met this barrier, this... Um, 13 foot fence, um, wire fence, and um, I uh, <laughs> I couldn't go any further. Basically, um, I tried to get over the fence, um, which uh, <laughs> you probably read in the book, and um, it didn't it didn't turn out too well. <laughs> <laughs> it certainly didn't turn out too well, but um, you know it was uh, it was it was certainly an adventure. Um, so anyway, the next day um, I tried to um, you know I I. I even today, I mean, I wrote to Hawass and asked him about this fence because this fence is called Hawass's Wall. You know, it just mm. literally cuts off the, the, the entire Giza Plateau for, for like miles, you know. You, you just can't get beyond this, this fence. So that was me heading through the Giza Plateau, heading southwest. Now, what I did the next day once I, I came up to, you know, was confronted by that obstacle, the next day... I tried a different tact. I walked right round the Giza Plateau, um, heading due south, but on the main road. And all the way down, I could see these. Uh, I could see the fence. I could see these um, um, towers. These these um, probably stone concrete towers with guards in them, with with um, rifles and whatnot. And it was all fenced <laughs> off. And I kept walking. I must have walked, I don't know how many kilometres I, I walked, probably maybe about uh, five kilometres or something, maybe six or seven kilometres, um, just kept going. And then eventually um, I came to a gate. I was beyond, I could see to the left, I was beyond Hawassi's wall at this point, but I've still got this, this fence and that, it continued for miles as well. I was trying to come up to the 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 secret location or what I call the apex point of where I thought this this hidden chamber might be um, from the south. I was trying to, whereas before I, I, I attempted it from the north, now I was trying to come at it from the south to walk up towards it from the south. But I couldn't get in from that direction either because there's this fence that just went for miles and miles and miles. You know, um, so that was, I mean, the reason I, I wanted to get to that that particular spot i mean it wasn't to i didn't have like a you know a shovel or a spade in the back or a pickaxe or anything like that i just wanted to to kind of go to that spot because of the significance which i think is geometrically attached to that spot and i'd actually taken with me at the time i'd, I'd got made a small um granite uh, made of, of scottish granite um pyramidian a small pyramid. You can hold it. You could hold it in, in one hand, and on the base of it, um, I had what I called the uh, Great Giza Triangle. Um, if you read the book, it will make sense to you. So I had that on the base of the pyramid because the, this theory, which I call the the centroid theory, creates this Great Giza Triangle, and that points to this specific location. So I had that engraved on the base of the. The, the very spot that this triangle, this great triangle at Giza points to, and I was hoping to bury it, you know, bury this small um, pyramid, pyramidian, under the sands at that location. But yeah. say a few words from the, the, the hymn to Osiris at the same time. So it was, it was more really like a, a, a sort of a homage, if you like, to the builders, um, because I... I still, even to this day, believe that there may be something important at that specific location. And and it's weird that they would have concrete towers with guards and everything else pretty much just off in the middle of the desert. Well, the, the explanation Dr. Hawass sent back to me was basically, um, what was it? Um, this is to protect our guests of Egypt. You know, this, you know it was just that short and, and that bland basically. I mean I know um, Egypt um, back then 
you know, did have um, problems with uh, the tourists being kidnapped and so forth. But I mean, it was it was very very rare, you know. Um, mm-hmm. You know, so and you don't have other sites like sites that um, you know Saqqara or Medum or um, any you know Dashur. You don't you know the pyramids there. They they're not fenced off like that at all. You know, so it, it just seemed a bit strange that the very the very. I mean, I I have stood Saraya. I have stood between the paws of the Great Sphinx looking at the dream stellar, reading the dream stellar between the paws of the Great Sphinx. Now, there are... I'm an amateur Egyptologist, yeah? I study ancient Egypt on an amateur basis. Now, there are badge-carrying Egyptologists, fully professional, qualified, qualified Egyptologists, that haven't been allowed to do that. You know, because it's such a well-guarded... Um, place and the permissions to get to go in there are you know hard to come by but not impossible yeah hmm. so i was able to get in there but i couldn't get into that that spot where there's just nothing but sand <laughs> you know so it just it seemed it seemed a bit strange it seemed a bit bizarre but hey ho you know one of these days i will <laughs> go back and i will make another attempt now, when you mentioned the Sphinx, I think the most famous secret chamber that most people are aware of is the one Casey predicted underneath the paw of the Sphinx. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I've I've read I've read a bit about that. Um, I've read that the you know some test bores drills were 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 put you know under the ground, and I think there's been some cavities found there. But you know, maybe there is. You know, I think. I mean, to, to to my mind, um, the whole the whole concept of um, building these pyramids it was a it was a one off project, and um, you know because this is this is one of the things that the ancient Egyptians tell us one of the, the myths or legends that come down to us. There's two stories, two main stories about the purpose of these giant pyramids that come down to us from ancient times and the stories that the, the, the were preserved by the Arab chroniclers is that the pyramids were built as tombs but the Arab, right. the Arab chroniclers also tell us that the pyramids I'll come back to the Sphinx thing in a, a few moments, the, the Arab chroniclers also tell us that the um, pyramids were also built effectively to secure the kingdom against the a great deluge that the, right. ancient, the ancient Egyptians believed was was um, about to strike their their kingdom. Well, not just about. They reckoned it would happen in three hundred years. That's what the king's um, astronomer priests told them. Something happened in the heavens, and King Saurid asked his astronomer priests. What does this change in the heavens mean? And they told the king, it means in 300 years' time there's going to be a great deluge which will drown the entire country. That's what they told them. And the king said, okay, we're going to build pyramids. And in those pyramids, we're going to secure everything that we need to ensure that the kingdom can be reborn again, can, can rise like a phoenix from, from the ashes of its destruction. So... And that is essentially what um, I call Project Osiris, because Osiris, um, you may notice, was identified with grain. Mm-hmm. He's a god, ancient Egyptian god of rebirth, of regeneration, but also the ancient Egyptian god of agriculture and grain. He's symbolized by grain. Now, that is one of the main things that they would have stored in these pyramids with seeds of all kinds, all manner of seeds, barley, wheat, um, all types of grain, corn, um, you know, tomato seeds, pepper seeds, you know, every type of, of seed that they would need um, in order to reseed the kingdom after it was completely washed away by this great deluge that they believed was coming their way. Now, whether it did or not, is actually material. They believed it was, it was going to happen. So this is this was their preemptive um, action um, in order to try and 
saved their, their civilization. They built these 16 pyramids. And in these pyramids, they stored one of, one of the things they would have stored is a whole load of um, seeds, grains of all kinds. Now, remember earlier I said that the first 16 pyramids, if you plot them on a map, they give you the, a rudimentary outline figure of the classic Osiris, yeah? Well, that was the body of Osiris, that, or that came to, re those 16 pyramids came to represent the body of Osiris, cut up into 16 pieces as the myth and legend of Osiris tells us. Now, they would have stored a lot of grain in those pyramids. Now, if you look at the pyramid of Saqqara, or the step pyramid at Saqqara, that's the first pyramid that the ancient Egyptians built. They didn't find a pharaoh's body in there. They actually found a bit of bone wrapped in um, mummy wrapping, a, a foot, I think it was. But it was it was carbon dated to be thousands of years after. The, mm. You know, Zoser, who was the king that supposedly had built this pyramid. Now, they didn't find any king in there. But what they did find in the step pyramid at Saqqara was, you know, tons and tons and tons of grain. <laughs> Tens of thousands of storage vessels of all kinds. Tens of, about 40,000 of them. And, you know, under the Step Pyramid, there's corridors, there's passageways that, that are literally, you know, there's, it, it's a warren, there's kilometres of passageways. And the early explorers, the first explorers in the early 20th century that went under that um, pyramid complex at Saqqara, they were walking through passageways, you know, almost knee deep. And grain. Yeah. You know, so this is what I'm saying. And, and there's evidence, there's secondary evidence as well, that the Great Pyramid once contained massive amounts of grain. I explain that um, in the book. So this is what I'm saying. The body of Osiris, you know, Osiris was identified with grain and agriculture, you know, because that's what they put in these pyramids. And the funny thing is, um, you know, um, the later uh, festivals that the ancient Egyptian later dynasties would have a festival called the Festival of Koak. And this was a, a festival to celebrate the death and rebirth of Osiris. And what the ancient Egyptians in these later dynasties would do is they would create small dolls made of clay about 18 inches, 20 inches tall. Yeah. And it was just made of clay and inside the clay, inside the mud, they would fill it, they would make a cavity and fill it with grain. Yeah. Hmm. And then they would wrap it in linen and then they would bury it in the ground and put a big rock on top of it, symbolising the pyramid. Sometimes they would even put the doll in what was called, a, it's like a miniature, for all intents and purposes, like a miniature sarcophagus. Yeah, and they would bury that in the ground and stick a big rock on top of it. You know, so here we have, the ancient Egyptians knew that... The, what was originally in these first 16 pyramids, they knew it was once upon a time filled with grain because it was the body of Osiris cut into 16 pieces, yeah, scattered across the land of Egypt, but originally it was filled with grain. This is why later on they're making you know, small effigies of Osiris filling the interior of the body with grain. They're doing the same thing, but obviously in, in you know, um, symbolic um, ceremonial um, fashion. And one of the other things that they would do, um, Soraya, is they would, they would, they would create these um, small um, like stone boxes, like miniature sarcophagus, yeah? And mm -hmm. they would fill it with earth and scatter some seeds on the earth. And then they would bury this box, they'd put a lid on it. You know, this is only about 18, 20 inches long. They would bury it in the sand and they would put a big rock on top of it, yeah? You know, so you've got a, a box of earth with a big rock on top of it. What's that all about? Well, uh -huh. if you go back to the actual pyramids, what did they find in the pyramids? Well, you know the the the, the pyramid of Khafra at, at Giza? That's the one that looks the tallest. But it's, actually, it's not the Great Pyramid, but it looks like the Great Pyramid. It's the one in the middle um, at Giza. A giant pyramid. When the... When Giovanni Belzoni went into that pyramid in 1818, he got to the chamber. 
he saw the stone, granite stone box, which Egyptologists call a sarcophagus, but which I call a nebank. A nebank means a possessor or con container of life. Bolzoni opened this box. He didn't find a body in it. What do you think he found in it? Wasn't it the bones of a bull? That's partly correct. He found it filled with earth. Oh, right, yeah. He found it filled with earth, and uh, when he, he, he sifted through this earth, he found f fragments of uh, bull bones. And again, the bull is connected with Osiris. The bull is connected with grain, because in the fields, the bulls would trample the grain into the ground so that it would um, germinate. You know, so this was a Teutonic ritual. These stone boxes had nothing to do with burying a king. It was an earth ritual. This box of earth was a Teutonic earth ritual about the earth being reborn, the kingdom being reborn, not the king being reborn. That would come later, you know, much later, um, after these um, pyramids, um, uh, which were built, for a very perfunctory practical reason to assist the kingdom in being reborn after the deluge had destroyed it. Which, well, we don't know if the deluge occurred, but if it did, then the pyramids did their job. They were obviously eventually emptied of um, all their, 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 their content. But in time, the, the pyramid structure itself would be associated with um, rebirth. You know, the, the pyramid shape um, is associated with the, there's a thing called the, 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 a, the apex of the pyramid. The capstone is called the um, Benben stone, which is named right. after the Egyptian bird, the Bennu bird. The Bennu bird has similar properties in ancient Egypt to the phoenix, whereby it's associated with things that rise from the dead or rise up from the ashes of its destruction. That's what the pyramid shape symbolizes. You know, so all this material, you know, it's all about the rebirth of the earth. You know, the ancient Egyptian creation myth talks about, you know, the the, the pyramid coming up out of the floodwaters, you know, and the, the pyramid mm. opening up and everything in creation comes out of the pyramids. It's what's inside the pyramid that comes out that allows the kingdom to be reborn, that allows the civilization to reboot itself. This is what the creation myth is telling us. You know, so this is what the the Arab texts tell us. But obviously in later times, these pyramids would be repurposed as tombs because they would become in time religious icons associated with rebirth. You know, it's a, a regeneration right. machine. So the king, well, he's thinking, no, I want a piece of that action. You know, <laughs> so he gets himself put in these things. He might even have built a smaller one for himself, you know, as the religion developed, you know, as the Osiris cult developed in time. You know, this, this is essentially what happened. But in the beginning, you know, these were practical um, things. Now, coming back to the Sphinx, yeah, coming back to the Sphinx, which is yeah. about the, the, the chamber um, down below, it seems to me that, you know, if you're building a recovery system and you're putting in recovery items, you know, you're wanting these to be found as quickly as possible. So the one thing you're going to do is make them as big as possible and strong as possible. People can see them for miles away. Yeah, you want them right. found. But that's not something you would want if you were the king of Egypt. You don't want your you don't want everybody every tomb raider in the land knowing where your tomb is. You just don't know. Oh. You know, so that's a, a complete contradiction that Egyptologists are, are, are presenting us with. Right, so but you do want it found as quickly as possible if these are like recovery vaults or arcs. You want it found as quickly as possible. Now, where are you going to put your precious items? Are you going to put them in the pyramids? Are you, hmm. are you going to put them somewhere else? Because if people know that there's precious items in these pyramids, you know, as soon as they're sealed up, you know, people are going to be breaking into them because they know there's, there's precious 
stuff in there. There's precious items, artifacts in there. They're going to get broken right. into. But if people know, well, all it's in it is some tools and grain. They're not going to bother. They just won't bother. Yeah. So where are you going to put your precious, you know, um, religious material artifacts? You're going to store them away somewhere that's hidden. That's why I'm thinking, well, the Sphinx isn't actually hidden. You can see it. You know, so would there really be a cavity under there, under the Sphinx, you know, to put precious items? Because, you know, you want you want these items to be found by not not just your average, you know, um, tomb raider, you know, who's who's basically, you know, just wanting it for for his own ends to enrich his enrich himself. You want right um, to be found by people of enlightened minds. So you're going to make it not obvious where this material is buried, and that, this is explained in the book. So I don't think, personally, I don't think the Sphinx, there will be anything of, of any great significance found under in this cavity under the Sphinx. But I do think the Sphinx serves a very, very crucial function um, at the Giza site, and that's also explained in the book. It's part of the, the Giza uh, star clock, part of the right. plan part of the plan of Project Osiris to build these 16 pyramids was to arrange some of them, and these are the ones at Giza, into a star clock so that they could tell, you know, they could mark the date when this, you know, site was created, when this event occurred, if you like, where they started building these pyramids. They've marked the date when they started building these pyramids. And the date, um, from what um, I can tell, from what I've been able to, to research and work out, is... Um, 17,000 BC, almost, these structures are almost 19,000 years old. And the remarkable thing is, Soraya, that corresponds with the, the start of the end of the last age, ice age. Yeah, right. Oh, which right. is almost about 20,000, 19, 20,000 years ago. You know, so something, we don't know what happened to bring about the termination of the last ice age. We're still not absolutely certain why that happened? What was the trigger that caused these great ice sheets to suddenly begin to melt after hundreds of thousands of years? What was the trigger? Did some did the Earth's pole move? Where these great ice sheets moved into a, a warmer climate, where they started, you know, to melt. And if that is the case, then it probably the myth that's come down to is that the ancient Egyptians saw something in the sky, saw that the stars had moved from their normal course and that this would mean in you know, 300 years' time a great flood would come. Well, it may all be part of the same thing. Right, right. And the, uh, we got we got to actually take a quick break yeah. and we'll be right back with Scott Crichton. Where Did the Road Go can be heard first and usually live on WVBR Saturday nights at 11 p.m. Eastern. Go to wheredidtheroadgo.com to ask questions of our live guests through the chat room. Where Did the Road Go is then re-aired on Dark Matter Radio and Deprogrammed Radio. You can download all shows for free on the website, and you can subscribe to us on Stitcher, iTunes, YouTube, or Vimeo. Additional content can be found on our video channels. You will also find our upcoming schedule, book reviews, blogs, free book downloads, links, and more. We are also on Facebook and Twitter, and if you want to help support the show, there are links to donate to us. Everything you need can be found at wheredidtheroadgo.com. All right, we're talking with Scott Wright tonight. His latest book is The Secret Chamber of Osiris, Lost Knowledge of the Sixteen Pyramids. And uh, you're actually only the second person I've ever heard call the pyramids arcs. The first was Edmund Marriage with the, the Golden Age Project. But they talked about uh, people actually hiding in the pyramids as well. Uh, his belief is that there was a cometary impact and the uh, pyramids were used to store not only grain and such, but actually people. Well, um, I, I, don't, I don't know about that. Um, I I'm probably don't go along with that, um, Saraya, because um, just basically because of the way that the, the pyramids were sealed. 
Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, <laughs> they 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 were sealed um, pretty tight, but not impregnable. This is this is one of the the remarkable things about the Great Pyramid. You know, it's supposed to be a tomb of the Pharaoh Khufu, but when you actually look at the physical um, practicalities of securing um, what was supposedly Khufu's burial chamber, the King's Chamber, and the Great Pyramid, it, it just does not add up at all. No, I, and this is explained. Even explained in the book so no i i, I don't really think um that you know that they were they were arcs for um people as such because i think beside the pyramids there are these i think people would probably have gone in boats you know boat arcs if you like and beside the 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 pyramids you know every pyramid that Giza, most pyramids there are these massive boat pits where there was yeah. once Massive boats. I suggest um, that those boats were there um, for, um, you know, obviously the elite of the people, you know, would um, take to the boats. You know, so they've, they've stored all the, the, the stuff that they need to reboot their kingdom in the arcs, the pyramid arcs that they built, and they would take to the boats um, beside um, the pyramid arcs. Now, the thing is, as well, Saraya, you know, the early... Christian writers, um, actually, there, there's images that, that we've got from, from Christian times which actually show that the the Ark in the early Christian times was described as a pyramid. Yeah, you have a drawing in the book yeah, on that. that's right. Yeah, you know, so um, it's, it's not a, a fantastic, um, you know, out there theory. After all, our own civilization it's kind of doing the same thing. We are, we have seed vaults, you know, all over the world and secret bunkers all over the world. And we've also got a backup to these seed vaults in um, Svalbard um, in the Arctic Circle. It opened in 2008. And that has got seeds stored there from all over the world in massive vaults in the um, Svalbard Global Seed Vault in case some catastrophe, unforeseen catastrophe happens to the earth. You know, so we're kind yeah. of doing the same thing, except the ancient Egyptians really believed something was going to happen because they saw something in the heavens that really worried them. And, w and when you get to the end of the Ice Age, just a, a polar shift wouldn't have been enough to melt the ice caps as quickly as they, they melted. I mean, it, it's like, what, under 100 years, they say they completely melted? No, I think and maybe even quicker. Well, um, they melted over you know several thousand um, years. The th the thing is, um, the the way the way the the ice sheets melt, it's gradually you know it's, it's generally speaking, um, it would be gradual. Um, right, well, I think it started out gradual, but there was some event yes, that caused them yes. to melt down very very suddenly. Yeah, that's right. What happens is the ice. The ice melts into effective, effectively what what is a big kind of bowl of water in the middle of the ice sheet. Yeah. Yeah. And there's there's moraine that's built up, um, you know, like gravel and stuff and ice, and that it's basically blocking all the holding all this water in. But eventually, the water builds up so much as the ice melts that the pressure of the water is so great that these moraine dams burst. They're breached. And then you have a massive outpouring of, you know, it, it defies description, really. You know, the, yeah. the most massive mega flood you could imagine. And one of these mega floods, I think it's um, Lake Ag Agassiz um, mega flood, right. um, that raised the global sea level. Um, one estimate is it raised the global sea level almost two meters you know, and it wouldn't, and it wouldn't just raise it; it would cause tsunamis oh, and earthquakes oh, oh. and unimaginable devastation all over the globe. You know, so so most of the world's populations, then as now, were living along the coastlines. Yeah, and so suddenly yeah. you've got the sea risen almost two meters. You know, that's just going to be horrendous devastation all over the world. You know, so yeah, the the the. the the ice melt, the sea level rise. The sea level back then, you know, 20,000, 19,000 years ago, was 400 feet lower than it is now. There was a gradual rise, yeah, but these gradual rises were punctuated by massive sudden leaps in sea level, which would have devastated, 
you know, um, cultures, civilizations all over the world. And uh, one of the things I really uh, liked that you did in this book is you kind of uh, did a lot of research on Howard Weiss. <laughs> Old Weiss, yeah, yeah, what a guy. Um, yeah, I did. Um, this was um, this was actually part of um, something that I was um, investigating about uh, some of Zechariah Sitchin's um, work. Um, Sitchin was the, the guy who first claimed that Howard Weiss faked the markings in these mm -hmm. um, hidden chambers above the king's chamber of the Great Pyramid. There's these um, painted marks that um, Howard Weiss apparently discovered in 1837. And Sitchin basically claimed that um, Howard Weiss um, faked these marks himself. Unfortunately, Sitchin's argument, uh, he could have, he could have um, done his research a little bit better. Some of his arguments there, I agree with um, the skeptics. There's, there's some big holes there. Um, but not in everything. Some of the things that Sitchin said still hold true today. Um, one of the thing, pieces of evidence that Sitchin presented was a, a logbook entry from a guy called uh, Walter Allen who lived in um, Pitts, Pittsburgh, uh, Pennsylvania. And in this logbook um, that Walter Allen wrote in 1954, he was a, a amateur um, genealogist and he was researching his family's history and he was speaking to his mother and some aunts and family elders and um, they basically told him a story about his great grandfather a guy called um, Humphreys Brewer who worked with Howard Weiss in 1837 at the pyramids and the story that was passed down to Walter Allen was this little segment where Humphreys Brewer had an argument, a disagreement with a couple of Vice's other assistants, a couple, of, a guy called Raven and another guy called um, Hill, about painting marks in the pyramid. What um, Brewer says that's come down to is, is that some marks um, were repainted, faint marks were repainted, but some were new. You know, so this is him basically saying, Vice and his guys, and he was arguing with them about this, about painting marks inside the pyramid. Now, that to me, I researched that. I said, well, wait a minute. Um, is there anything that backs up what, um, you know, how um, Humphreys Brewer is actually saying? So some people, some of the skeptics, the debunkers, were saying, oh, this guy Humphreys Brewer didn't even exist because he's not mentioned anywhere in Howard Weiss's published books. Right. And he published them um, two full volumes and an appendix, and he's not mentioned in any of them. Why? You know, so I thought, well, that's, that, that's a bit odd. That's a bit odd. So I, um, I thought, right, well, what can I do here? So I managed to track Howard Weiss's field notes, his actual handwritten field notes to a small sort of library um, down in Aylesbury in the north, north London. I managed to find his actual handwritten field notes, not his published notes, because I thought, well, if I could find those, maybe he mentions Humphreys Brewer in his field notes, but just didn't, but redacted them from his published, bo his published books because of what he was basically saying that, you know, hey, you're a fraud. You know, who's going, right. to, who's going to write that, you know, uh, that story <laughs> in their published account? You know, so I'm thinking, well, maybe maybe I can prove Humphreys Brewer was at Egypt in 1837 by finding the guy's, um, you know, uh, written notes. And I managed to find the notes and I, managed, I found a whole lot more in those written notes than I bargained for. And it's explained in the book. Okay. All right. Yeah, and you you really put a lot of work into researching him too. I mean, you said his writing was essentially unlegible. It's it's shockingly bad. Um, you know, I I was reading um, certain passages of um, his handwriting. You know, and I was spending days, literally, on one line. <laughs> literally on one line I was spending days you know so but fortunately I got some help from um, various places um, in, including some um, 
uh, archive is in uh, uh, a very famous library here in Glasgow, the, the Mitchell Library. And um, there's some um, really good people in there who were used to handling, you know, um, early 19th century documents, handwritten documents, and they were able to to, to help me um, fairly substantially to, to um, read some of it. And the other thing as well, because he, he wrote these books as well, I could actually use his published books and go to the same date in the handwritten mm. notes and, and cross-check to try and find words. You know, and I was able to do that. So eventually I was able to um, get a grasp, a fairly good grasp. I wouldn't say I'm by any means an expert because there's still large, you know, his writing, I, I don't know if you have the same problem um, in the States there, Soraya, but, you know, when we get a, a doctor's prescription here, you know, to go to the <laughs> pharmacy for some drug, it's just like a line, you know, but yeah. you know, somehow the pharmacist can read it, you know, <laughs> it's incredible, <laughs> you know, so it, it's almost like that. In, 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 so, in some instances, you know, so but eventually I was able to um, to read um, some of his, his his handwriting. But so some of the things, the, the, the great irony here is that he wrote some hieroglyphs in his um, handwritten notes, which I could read no problem, you know, <laughs> because right, you know right. I could read these no problem, but I couldn't read his own handwriting. Um, so, but but the irony is the the hieroglyphs that he wrote in his book totally contradicted what he'd written in his published book. Yeah, yeah. You know, so yeah. this is um, this 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 really raised some big big questions about the authenticity. Um, of um, those marks, and I, I put um, the detail of that in this book. But since then, I've found a whole lot more material. Um, that, that, I mean, how advice, just, just to give your listeners a, a brief synopsis, the guy was, uh, he was a military man. He came from a wealthy, wealthy family. He was what we call the landed gentry here in the UK. Um, you know, his family were very wealthy landowners. And um, he became a politician. He was an MP for some time. Um, but the way he came about being an MP, I explain that in the book as well. He basically bribed his way um, into becoming an MP, um, which, uh -huh. which was basically against the law at the time. He broke the law to, to become an MP. You know, he wouldn't, he's the kind of guy that, you know, if, if he couldn't get what he wanted by um, conventional, you know, um, legitimate means, he would he wouldn't be shy about you know um, doing what needed to be done to get right. what he wanted. You know, so this is the kind of guy that um, you're dealing with here. Um, so Howard Vice, yeah, I, I write. Um, there's there's a chapter in the book um, about him, but as I said, I found a whole load more uh, material about this this fraud um, that um, I believe strongly he perpetrated in 1837 with with his with a couple of his assistants, and um, all the, the as I said, there's a, a considerable amount of evidence in uh, the secret chamber of Osiris. But my new book, Great Pyramid Hoax, um, which will be coming out um, next year, um, has got a whole load more um, new evidence um, to put forward, which essentially, to my mind, proves beyond a reasonable doubt that the markings that he claims were genuine are not genuine at all. And the thing that does, um, Soraya, it basically, because this the thing about these markings is it, it, it names Khufu and Kunum Kuf, that's his full name, as the builder of the the pyramid. Or we find those names in the pyramid. So Egyptologists put two and two together, that means he built it. Well, if, it turns out that those marks are actually faked. It, right. It basically, the, the Great Pyramid becomes anonymous again. You know, at a stroke... It pulls a rug um, from under um, the the Egyptologist contention that 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 those markings prove um, that Khufu built the the pyramid. I'm not saying that Khufu didn't. All I'm saying is that well, you can't rely on these marks because I think 
I genuinely think, and I think there's a lot of um, good evidence now to say that those marks are not genuine. Right, right. And uh, the only other markings that were found anywhere in the pyramid were on the, at the end of the shaft there, beyond the door where they put the camera and they can see a few markings inside there. <laughs> well, you know, the great irony here is, um, Soraya, the great irony of those markings is that um, there's a Egyptologist who specializes in um, Egyptian mathematics, and he believes um, those numbers read in, in that um, small cavity um, which the, the robot drilled through at the end of the shaft, he believes those number, those are numbers and it's number 121. The thing is, if you those cavities, that small cavity is at the very same level as Campbell's chamber of the Great Pyramid. Now that's one of the ca the chambers that um, Colonel Vice um, broke into and apparently found all these markings. Now the thing is, in Campbell's chamber, and it's at the same level, very same level of the pyramid, which means because the pyramid was built in layers, yeah? Block uh -huh. and block and block and block was built in layers. They're at the same layer. So you've got numbers in this small cavity at the same layer as numbers in Campbell's chamber. You've got the number in um, this small cavity, it says uh, 21, and you've got number 21 written in Campbell's chamber. And they're both in a completely different language. Really? Yeah. Huh. I didn't realize there was anything written in Campbell's chamber. Oh, yeah, that's where they found um, the Khufu um, uh, cartouche in Campbell's chamber um, mm. at the very top. But there's also other markings. Oh, at the top, okay. The very okay. top, yeah, that's the, uh, you know, the very top of the, the above the, the king's chamber um, is, is Campbell's chamber. Um, so they found on the wall there, they found um, the number 21. There's other numbers as well, but number 21 is there. But it's written in a completely different language from, not language, but a com completely different character set from what this yeah. guy believes is the number 21 in this, this chamber that was built at the same level. Now, if you're building something like the Great Pyramid, you know, you're not going to use different numbers a different number system. You're going to use, you know, a, a, a language, you know, that that everybody can understand. They're all agreeing. Yep, that's that. They're, you're not going to have have different um, character sets, different, you know, because somebody might not know what that is, and then they get it all wrong. You know, you're going to have a standard method of numbering things, and something right. as complex as the Great Pyramid. So why are they using a completely different character set to write twenty one? there and which obviously is obviously genuine in this small chamber because the only thing that's ever been in there is a camera right an optical camera yeah so, so they're genuine the thing is are these characters that say 21 in campbell's chamber which have advice opened genuine because that's where this cartouche has um, been found as well but, right, but what, what are the chances they'd write 21 in that chamber and then we'd find 21 in another chamber as well? Well, um, in the other chamber, the small chamber where they, they put the optical camera through, it, it's actually 121. Oh, okay. It's 121, so I, I was just keeping it uh, uh, simple for you. Um, so they've written 21 in, in one chamber, and there's other numbers in there as well. In Campbell's chamber, there are other numbers as well. Um, there's 10, there's, you know, there's other numbers, but they wrote 21, and in their small chamber, they wrote 121, you know, but in a completely different character. You know? huh. So, and these, you have to understand, are at the same level. So they were built by, you know, the same builders, the same. Okay, I see what you're saying. Or whatever, you know, but they're using a completely different, you know, style of language um, to write write these um, numbers. So that, hmm. to me, tells me that, you know, the, these numbers in this small chamber are obviously genuine from a right. much earlier age, a much, much earlier age. The characters that we found in Campbell's chamber are definitely Fourth Dynasty. So how did you get those Fourth Dynasty characters in Campbell's chamber, but you've got characters from a much earlier time? 
And we, sh we should also mention for anyone who doesn't know, those relieving chambers, as they're called, above the king's pier uh, above the king's chamber, were not open. They were actually blasted with expl uh, explosives to yeah. get into them. Yeah, Vice um, used gunpowder um, to blast um, openings into them. Um, and it, it was desperate to make an important discovery. He says this throughout. You know his his volumes, his published volumes. He was desperate to make an important discovery. He was desperate to find um, the the sarcophagus of um, Khufu, but he never did. And um, <laughs> you know he, you know he spent something. I think it's something in the region of ten thousand pounds, which in 1837 I think I think it comes out to about a million pounds or half a million wow. pounds nowadays. An awful lot of, of his own family fortune. I had nothing really to show for it at the end of the day. Um, but, well, ultimately he may not have found Khufu, but he certainly found Khufu's name, hmm. allegedly. Right, right. Um, we're almost out of time, but the one thing I wanted to ask you about also is the shafts and where they point to. Uh, because you have a different take on it than some of the other yeah. researchers do. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't actually think the... The shafts um, point to anything. The, the, the Egyptologists tell us that the shafts are to allow the point to a star, so that the king's soul can go up the shaft and you know go, right. go off to where whatever star. What I think the shafts are all about is they actually show. You know th these structures. I'm saying something happened. This is a legend that's come down to us. Something happened in the heavens, and this is why they built the pyramids. The shafts. Show us what happened in the heavens. The lower shafts are both at 33. The, the angle of inclination is 33 degrees. Those are the two shafts that come out the lower chamber, the, the queen's chamber. Um, both north and south are both 33 degrees. The southern chamber of the kings is at 45 degrees. So that's a difference from the lower chamber. Oh, sorry, they're not 33 degrees. They're both at 39 degrees. My apologies, 39 degrees. And the upper shaft from the king's chamber south is at 45 degrees. That's a difference of six degrees. If you go over to the northern side, the lower chamber's at 39 degrees, but the upper chamber's dropped to 33 degrees. So that's, again, a difference of six degrees. What these are actually showing you is the sky moving. They're actually pointing to the former position. The, the lower chamber's pointed to the form. Remember, the, the Great Pyramid symbolizes or represents the star in Orion's belt, Al-Nitak. The lower chamber points to the former position of Al-Nitak before the skies were disturbed. And the upper right. shaft shows its new position after Would, the pole shift. And that might be why the lower chambers are sealed off, because they're the previous yes, locations. Yes, yes. Don't look here anymore. You know, you can't see it, you know. It's basically data, if you like, the angles. It's not so much um, that, you know, they're pointing at a star per se. It's the angles of the shafts that are actually the important piece of information, not what they're pointing at. If it, We know it symbolises Al-Nitak because the Great Pyramid, you know, symbolises Al-Nitak. So we know it's referencing Al-Nitak. So it's saying Al-Nitak was at this angle, and then suddenly it was at that angle or inclination. You know, and that can't happen overnight. You know, right, that simply right. can't happen overnight. You know, for that to happen using precession, I think it takes something like 1,600 years for that kind of shift to happen. And we know, well, we're told the Great Pyramid was built in 20 years. You know, so something happened to rapidly move Al Nitak, the star Al Nitak, from 39 degrees up to 45 degrees, and the northern star, the northern shafts, are basically just mirroring what is what is going on in the south. It's not actually pointing at stars per se. It's just giving us the angles to show us how the how the skies moved. Because again, as what I've, I've kept saying tonight, that is what the legend tells us. The legend tells us the heavens, the stars moved out of their normal place, and that is what the shafts are showing us. Right. Right, and uh, you also talk about some of the uh, evidence that, some, like, the king's chamber had been repaired. Um, yeah, there's um, um, some. There was some catastrophe or disaster 
inside the king's chamber. Um, you know, there's damage in there. The, the walls, the granite walls of the king's chamber have been slightly pushed outwards by some powerful force. There's apparently the scorch marks of, you know, on the sarcophagus in there. Um, you know, the ceiling is cracked. I think it's in the southeast corner. There's an ancient... This wasn't done by Howard Vice by his gunpowder blasting the, the, the chambers above the king's chamber. This is ancient plaster that's been put into these cracks um, to repair it. You know, so something happened in the king's chamber. There was an almighty explosion of some kind in the king's chamber. And I explain that also um, in the book. And it, it ties in with the, the black dust that was found mm -hmm. by Howard Vice um, and all these, these five chambers above the king's chamber, you know, so that's that again is all, all explained um, in the book. You, you also mentioned that there was one pyramid where they tried to put casing stones on later, but they built it on sand rather than solid ground. Well, again, this is this is um, you know, Egyptologists will, will say, Scott, you're talking rubbish, we've got carbon dating dates. Um, that date the Great Pyramid to, you know, I think it's 2,700. They've got some dates, carbon dates, that are 3,100. But, you know, they, ex they explain all this away with the, the old wood issue and all the rest of it. You know, so this, we've got these carbon dates of, you know, carbon dating dates, C14 radio carbon dates of, you know, the period that we think, um, you know, Khufu lived and built this structure. But what mm -hmm. I'm saying is, well, okay, maybe you've got these carbon dating dates, you know, they took carbon out the mortar between the blocks of the Great Pyramid. But what I'm saying is that, well, I actually think um, the original structure structure there may have been a step pyramid, like, um, you know, the, the step pyramid at Saqqara and the, the step pyramid at Maidum. The original structures were step pyramids, and it was the fourth dynasty that basically were repairing them and converting them into smooth-sided um um, pyramids with um, you know the white casing stone and all the rest of it because if you look at the pyramid at Maidum it's a step pyramid, it's core the core of the pyramid at Maidum is like the very first pyramid of Zosar, the step pyramid at Saqqara the step pyramid at Maidum the, you know, uh, the, the guy that Egyptologists say built it, Sneferu, who was Khufu's father basically built um, he converted that step pyramid, he originally built a step pyramid, allegedly, and then decided to convert it into a true pyramid. But I think therein lies the truth of the whole situation, what the ancient Egyptians of the fourth dynasty were doing. They were converting older structures into true pyramids because the the, the true pyramid, the outer casing stones at Maidum, simply collapsed because what, Snef, what the original builders had done They'd built that step pyramid because they were good engineers on a solid rock, solid rock foundation. Snefru came along and added on to, to convert that step pyramid into a true pyramid by building on sand. You know, so here, <laughs> he, that's why it collapsed. You know, that's why the right. outer, you know, true pyramid shape collapsed because he didn't know what he was doing, basically. <laughs> You know, so you have, you really have two civilizations going on here and it's all being confused and mixed up as if it's one, you know, one civilization. I think, you know, we need to extract, you know, we need to um, pull these things apart. You know, they've been merged and confused. We need to separate them out. You know, originally the, the, the Project Osiris, 19,000 years ago, they built a step pyramid. You know, what's, right. thousands of years later, the people that discovered that, you know, that um, came to Egypt much later, discovered these structures and were converting them um, into um, true pyramids, you know, for their burial or, or repurposing them for, for whatever. But they, they didn't have they didn't understand engineering like the people that actually built the step pyramid. At Maidum, who built it on a solid rock foundation, but Snefru built his <laughs> his addition on sand, and that's why it collapsed. Now, when when you talk about these things being arcs for seeds and stuff, how do you uh, account for like some of the uh, sonic effects in the pyramid, like the way sound is is 
move through the pyramid and uh, how people have, like Graham Hancock, even have talked about it as being a ritual or a consciousness altering device. Well, if, if anything, um, our discussion here tonight, um, Soraya, you, you probably um, guess that, that, that my work is very much of a practical nature. You know, these these were structures built for a, you know, a very you know perfunctory practical purpose. Um, you know, if you build a pyramid um, and you use granite and use different shapes of granite, and you strike that granite with a bar of some kind, yeah, you're going to get vibrations of all different kinds. Now, was that designed? I don't know. I can't answer that question. Um, maybe, maybe there there was some ancient um, ritual by the original builders because remember, I'm saying that these structures were built, you know, to ensure the kingdom could be reborn. They were Teutonic rituals. They were earth rituals. You know, so maybe these original builders, you know, maybe they wanted, um, they understood vibrations of some kind that, I don't know, maybe had an effect on on seats and, and stone boxes. You know, who knows? I don't know. That's pure speculation on my part. Um, but, you know, we don't know um, why, you know, they, they, they fashioned the granite blocks above the king's chamber in certain ways. We just really don't know why they did it. And, you know, um, the, when you strike them, they do create different vibrational effects. Is that just, you know, because that's what they do and that's what they are, or were they designed to do that? You know, it's, it's anyone's guess, really. But what I'm saying is, um, you know, these were about rebirth of the kingdom, not original right. the king. And it was a Teutonic, it's about the rebirth of the earth. So I think, yeah, there were probably some earth rituals. You know, that's why they placed a box in, the, in these pyramids filled with earth and sealed it. You know, there's some deep earth, you know, mystery or um, ritual going on there. All right, okay. I also I meant to mention this earlier too, but when you mentioned uh, the sixteen pyramids as being part of Osiris, you mentioned that there were seventy-two co-conspirators with Seth. Yeah, and uh, that's of course a pro processional number as well, which you find just throughout everything. Yeah, absolutely, um, because um, I I think the whole thing about you know the whole Osiris myth is about you know creating the body of Osiris, the sixteen pyramids, but also at Giza. They created a processional clock at Giza, and I explain that again to that in great depth um, in the book. Um, you know, so um, you know that again. I think is a, another key, a clue as to you know um, the the whole processional um, clock, star clock that we have at Giza. Remember as well, Osiris. The legend of Osiris came to be before Osiris, according to the legend of Osiris, the earth only had 360 days. Yeah. After Osiris, it had 300, when Osiris was born, the earth had 365 days. So the earth gained five days. You know, if you <laughs> multiply five by 72, you know, you're getting 360, you know, and then again, you're getting all these processional numbers again, you know. Osiris was born on the first day of the, the extra five days and his brothers and sisters were born on the other days. You know, so again, this is all linked into the, did the Earth originally have a solar, you know, an annual cycle of 360 days? Then something happened to the Earth to disturb its axis, to, you know, to slow its rotation, its orbit around the sun. Did something happen? You know, so <clears throat> to me, it's all tied in together the whole Osiris myth is about um, catastrophe, a catastrophe occurring, but preparing, you know, to, um, you know, to preparing the kingdom to survive this catastrophe. And this is what the whole Osiris myth about being cut into 16 parts and scattered across Egypt and being reborn again, you know, via the pyramid, via the agency of Osiris. That's what the whole myth is about. But it's about, you're right, it's about procession 
as well because they did create a star clock and, and a, it was almost like a plan within a, a plan, if you like. They created a star clock um, using procession to date um, the, when this, this event took place. A bit like our own civilization, Soraya, has, I, I don't know if you're aware of this, the Hoover Dam. Yeah, when, yeah. when they built that, they, they basically looked at the stars straight above the Hoover Dam and they mark they mark those stars on the floor of the the entranceway, the forecourt uh, of the entranceway at the Hoover Dam. You know, so that that configuration of stars straight above, you know, the Hoover Dam at the time it was built, basically locks in time when that dam was was built. Well, the ancient right. Egyptians are the builders of this. Um, this system, this processional star clock at Giza, have effectively done the same thing or a similar thing. All right. Well, I highly recommend the book, The Secret Chamber of Osiris, Lost Knowledge of the Sixteen Pyramids. I've only scratched the surface in this this conversation about the <laughs> amount of data you have in here. Yeah, there's a lot in that book. A lot of a lot of different ideas, a lot of um, sort of um, new insights. And uh, what's your website? Um, your listeners could go to www.scottcrichton.co.uk. All right. And I thank you so much for spending time with us and for this work. It's fantastic. And you said the next book will be out in 2016? Yeah, probably towards the end of um, 2016. That's um, the Great Pyramid Hoax. Um, so that will be out um, sometime next year. All right. Well, looking forward to it. And thank you so much. Soraya, it has been a pleasure. Thank you for inviting me onto your show. I've really enjoyed myself. Thank you.